uh, Dr. Claudia Harsh is with us today from Germany. And uh, she is uh, one of the world's leading experts in uh, language learning and teaching, and especially in learning, teaching, and assessment, which is her spe specialization areas. She is professor for language learning and teaching at the faculty 10 languages and literature at the University of Bremen in Germany and also is the director of the Languages Center of the Universities in the land of Bremen. She currently acts as the vice president of the International Language Testing Association. And uh, along with her research interests and her numerous publications, she focuses on language assessment, educational evaluation, measurement, intercultural communication, and the implementation of the CEFR in uh, in Germany and elsewhere. So she has worked in the UK as well as in uh, over all over Europe. And it is our greatest pleasure to have with us uh, a scholar par excellence, uh, Professor Claudia Harsh, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Shantanu Ghosh, for your lovely introduction. I feel very honored to be here. And uh, I'll try and uh, make the lecture as interactive as possible, as I understand some of you are on the YouTube channel, but I think, believe we can communicate with each other. So I'll share my screen with you. Um, does that work for you guys? Can you see? Yes, we can. It tells me the screen sharing was interrupted, but you can see me. No, I can see, I can see it. So that's language education proficiency yeah. and what it means to be. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And it's also, you can also see it on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Excellent. Then let's get started. I would like to talk today about the CFR, the Common European Framework of Reference and its proficiency levels and what it means to be at a CFR level. And the Common European Framework of Reference isn't only used in Europe, but it has gained importance beyond Europe. I was working with teachers in Cuba or in Indonesia with this instrument. So it may be of interest for you in India as well. And I'll try and uh, explain a little bit more what it is, what it can do for us and what it can't do for us. So what are we going to cover? As I said, what the CFR is and what it is not, and why the local context matters, uh, how we can align exams to the CFR, and under which conditions we may compare different uh, exams via the CFR alignment, and a brief outline. Let's get started with the CFR. Now, if we were in a lecture hall, I would ask you guys, who has ever heard of the CFR? Maybe we can try with this question, maybe in YouTube or here you can post your comments and uh, let us know how many of you know what the CFR is, what the Common European Framework of Reference is. And maybe Shantanu can help me with collecting yes, your answers. I think, uh, I think there are some uh, comments on the YouTube channel. So one, two, three people have heard about it. And I personally did not know about it till I was working on my PhD in the 2004, when I, was, when I came to know about the Australian migrant education program and I was searching for similarities. So yeah. EU framework came up uh, as another analogous thing to yeah. TOEFL and uh, IEL standards. Excellent. So let's have a look for those of you who haven't heard of this framework yet. It is first and foremost a language policy instrument of the Council of Europe. They wanted to foster multilingualism in Europe and beyond. So this is a language policy instrument and it describes relevant aspects of language learning, teaching and assessment. It's available online as a PDF, but also as a printed book. And uh, this, this it describes what what tasks learners can do, what curricular aspects are important, what uh, uh, aspects in assessment you may want to take into consideration. And it wants to facilitate communication and reflection amongst practitioners. 
Uh, it provides a common meta language so that we can talk about what our learners can do and what we can expect at certain levels of proficiency. So it wants to enhance communicative competence and mobility by providing a framework to enable comparisons. So it's not a testing system and it's not a system where you can use it ready-made and put your learners on these levels and then say, well, I don't need to take a TOEFL, I take the CFR. That's not what it is. It is really a framework, a descriptive framework that helps us as practitioners to grasp what our learners can do to communicate expectations and to communicate curricular aims and outcomes or to communicate content and language related aspects that we want to assess or that we expect our learners to have at a certain point in their educational trajectory. So that is what the CFR is. And at the heart of the CFR, and the CFR has nine chapters, and at the heart of the CFR are two chapters that describe on, uh, on six levels of proficiency what learners can do. And I'm confident you have heard of these levels because they play a huge role when you want to go and study in different countries. The language requirements usually are aligned to these levels from A1, A2 to B1 and B2. Usually B2 is expected if you um, um, take up undergraduate studies in English as the medium of instruction. Um, C1, when you want to pursue a PhD in an English medium uh, environment. And C2 is mastery, but mastery doesn't mean uh, the same um, proficiency as native speakers. Native speakers differ quite uh, from us non-native speakers. Or I, I see myself as a non-native speaker in India. That is a bit of a different uh, aspect because you use English as a lingua franca and it is kind of an, an own variety. So there is no decision yet as to where the different varieties of English, be it native speaker English, be it the inner or the outer circle or in whichever way you want to conceptualize, the CFR doesn't really have an answer for that uh, complex aspect, which is another avenue of research that would be interesting to undertake. So these are the six proficiency levels and the CFR originally was describing adult learners who move into a different country, the language of which the learners have to learn. And it wasn't originally covering, for example, younger kids in school. It wasn't covering um, multilingual aspects people with several uh, languages in their repertoire. But the Council of Europe has um, continued their work and there is now a framework describing multilingual competences. And we also have now descriptions of what young learners can do. So the work is going on. And uh, recently in 2018, the scale system uh, that is at the heart of the CFR describing communicative competence in different areas of uh, activities and strategies and competences that has been revised. And you may have heard of the companion volume. It's also available online where the scales have been revised and new scales have been added. So the work is ongoing and you find ever more sophisticated descriptions online at the Council of Europe language policy pages. Besides these descriptions of what language learners can do, there is also a development called the European Language Portfolio. Again, it's by the Language Policy Division of the Council of Europe. And this is an, an, an approach to uh, giving learners, uh, empower learners and let them document their language learning trajectories and journeys. And in this language uh, portfolio, you can collect um, the stages of learning, you can collect uh, examples of what you have achieved in the, your different languages, so that for yourself as a learner, you can document what you can do and what you have achieved over time, um, but you also can use that portfolio when you, example, for example, apply for a job, you could show the portfolio to your new employer. There's also a lot of information online on the portfolio and how you can document your language learning trajectory. 
which come which leaves us in the realm of self-assessment. Self-assessment is also part of the language portfolio, again, to empower learners and their agency so that a learner can look at where am I and also then um, determine what, what goals do I want to achieve? Where do I want to go next? And there is in the CFR a self-assessment grid. And now I don't know how we can do this. Um, um, I could try and paste in the, in the chat here the link because the guys in the, in the YouTube channel, you could also just um, search on Google for the CFR uh, self-assessment grid, but I'll try and uh, see whether I can copy in the chat. Mm, while I'm presenting, it seems that I cannot access the chat. Mm. Could somebody assist me how we could get the link yeah, to so, so our... You have, the, you have the view options over there. So uh, when you... Ah, uh, the thank you. Below, so there you can go to the chat. I'm trying. So, or, or you can press Alt H. So that would open the chat button. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Great tip. Here we go. I pasted the link in the chat. And if you wanted to have a quick look at this page, you find self-assessment grids in many, unfortunately, only European languages. Um, but you find it for English, for example, and maybe you speak any other European language. Um, the CFR self-assessment grid has so far not yet been published in other languages. But what you could do is have a look at the grid and see whether you can place yourself on this grid. What I can do now, give me one second, I'll share that screen with you. Then if you can't access it, at least you can see it. And this is the self-assessment. Yeah, probably that might be better. Yeah, that's the easier way. So this is how the self-assessment grid works. You have the different CFR levels from A1 to C2 for the different areas, listening, reading, reading, spoken, interaction, production, and writing. And for example, you then can go through this. I, I'll, I'll make it a bit bigger. For listening in one of your foreign or second languages, you can look at A1, you're expected to recognize only familiar words and very basic phrases. So that's a very simple task. At B1 in listening, you can already understand the main points of clear standard speech, but only in familiar matters that you regularly encounter in work, school, leisure, and so on. You can identify the main points of many radio TV programs. And when we go all the way up to C2, a proficient speaker has no difficulty in understanding any kind of spoken language, whether live or broadcast, even when delivered at fast native speed, provided they have some time to get familiar with the accent. So, that's the self-assessment grid that is available in different languages if you're interested to assessing your own language uh, proficiency in any language um, that you may speak. I'll go back to my presentation. Here we go. Here we are again. So that is perhaps a first starting point for language learners and for language teachers to have a look. Where are my students? What can they already do? Um, where do I go next? If there's any questions, please um, put them in the chat box also on in the YouTube channel. And maybe Shantanu, you could then um, let me know if there is any questions, anything I should go into more depth. Now, we have a bit of a grasp that the CFR is a language policy instrument. It gives us information. It gives us different descriptions of what learners can do on different levels in different areas. And uh, we can use it for self-assessment. We can use it as teachers. If we know our students very well, we have a good, good estimation, a good judgment where at the CFR levels they may be. 
It can also help us to plan our teaching and align curricula to it. But what is the CFR not? It cannot do everything for us. It's not a precise measurement instrument. We're in the realm of languages and not in the realm of, for example, um, exact um, measurements in the natural sciences. So it, it's not like a, a tool that converts Kelvin in Celsius in Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, the CFR cannot do that for us. And it's not the gold standard in language education. It's often sold as the standard. It's often used as a normative instrument, but that's not what the Council of Europe really wanted to do. It's up to us as users to make sure that we use it in the right way. It's not setting the standards. We, we, in, we as local um, um, responsible teachers and curriculum developers, we have to set our own standards. We have to look into our context. What do we need in these contexts? The CFR can't do that for, for us. There is a good question uh, in the chat. Can we use the CFR framework for any other languages like Hindi or Bengali, which is a very good question. Um, I know that in China, they, they, they have developed their own, um, they call it the standards, the Chinese standards of English. They have uh, developed their own framework because the Chinese language is so different from the European languages that they also have uh, developed their own framework for how Chinese people with a Chinese language background learn English. So I am not sure, and I have to admit, I, I'm not aware that the CFR framework has been applied for Hindi and Bengali. It may be possible depending on the structure of these languages, but bear in mind that you may need different aspects and additional aspects, particularly if you have learners with a background with a different alphabetic system. Because with the European languages, many of the European languages use the same alphabet, so we don't have to look into how we learn different alphabets. That gets more complex if we look into the, the Slavic languages like uh, Polish or Russian. There you have to learn a new alphabet. And you have to make amends to the scales because they are not addressing any learning issues and proficiency issues with regard to the alphabetic aspect. So you may want to address these issues. And also if they're differently structured like Chinese or Thai languages that are tonal languages, these aspects are also not addressed in the CFR. So you may have to develop more scales and more areas of uh, proficiency that are currently not addressed in the CFR. So that is another aspect that the CFR can't do. That is not everything is covered in the CFR. And it's not a rule, it's not a, a ruler. So we can't, we can't measure language competences directly with the CFR. It really just gives you an informative framework and you have to fill the framework with life and with your own learning context and with the particularities in your learning context. We have another question in the chat. How does self-assessment differ from normative tests? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I think it differs in quite a number of ways. First of all, learners know pretty, pretty exactly, pretty precisely what they can do and what they can't do. If you ask them, if you give them specific situations. Can you book your own railway ticket? Can you order a meal in a restaurant? If you're with a dentist, can you explain the dentist where the pain is? So learners have a pretty good um, judgment of what they can do. And we know from research, uh, more proficient learners tend to underestimate and less proficient learners, beginners tend to overestimate. But if you give them a list of precise descriptions of situations, they can pretty much um, assess themselves. Can I do this very well or not so well? So they base their judgments on a huge amount of knowledge and experience. And that also holds for teachers who know their learners well. Teachers know their learners maybe over a whole school year, maybe over two or three years. So they have experienced their students uh, and what they can do. So teachers and students may use the CFR uh, descriptions and get a good estimation of where they are in, in the European, in, in the CFR framework. Um, 
normative tests, so to speak, um, standardized tests, um, they can only measure a certain snapshot in time. So your proficiency is huge. And if you sit a standardized test, you have maybe three hours to show what you can do. And the test only gives you certain snapshots, only certain situations. So what the test shows you is only a fracture of, you, of what you really can do. And the fracture, the lens has to be large enough and cover enough situations so that the uh, standardized test gets a good impression of your skills. Um, but uh, there is a lot of work going into the task development and a lot of work into how your performance then is assessed and scored. And all this you don't have to do in self-assessment because you know yourself. So self-assessment is perhaps more directly assessing based on a huge amount of information you as a learner have available. Whereas the standardized tests have a limited amount of information, but they use um, reliable and valid tasks in order to get this information. And for high stakes decisions, mostly you will refer to normative tests because you know that everybody has to take the same hurdle. And with self-assessment that is a valid way of um, giving additional information in the formative language classroom and in, in your own learning development. But I guess high stakes decisions, um, the decision makers will not regard your own assessment as reliable as, it's, as an assessment with an external instrument, where you really have to prove what you can do. And the CFR, as I said, is not that high stakes instrument. It cannot measure your language um, proficiency directly and give you a score. Now, when I talk about scores, you may say, hey, hang on. I had a look at the TOEFL um, web page and uh, I found this score alignment table. And here the TOEFL scores are aligned to the IELTS band, so you can convert the two. And I just said it's not that easy in language uh, education. We can't really measure precisely. But the question that you just posed on the, on the normative tests, they do try and measure language proficiency. And uh, they do it in a way that you actually can assign a score or a score band to a learner's proficiency. And this alignment, however, isn't done on self-assessment, it's not done on a learner thinking this way or one learner having taken these two tests. But when you read how they achieved this score comparison table, um, then they say score comparison ranges with the highest degree of confidence based on the analysis of 1,153 individuals who took both tests. So, we have quite a large number of individuals who have taken these tests, and then you can do statistical um, calculations in order to align the two tests. And ETS also says it does not endorse using these tables to calculate cut scores when it comes to taking high stakes decisions like career and hiring or university access. Then institutions wishing to set such cut scores, they should study the two tests and work with test results to set cut scores that are appropriate to meet their specific needs, meaning the needs in the local context. And that is also something I would say, we do have to look at the constructs of the tests, comparable scoring criteria, the levels they are reporting, uh, the classification that results out of the reports, and of course, the local context. Because if you take up uh, PhD studies in statistics, you may not need as much writing proficiency as if you are taking up um, MA studies in English as a foreign language teaching. So the local context does matter and you would be well advised to also look at the um, the content and the construct of the tests in order to set your entrance scores right. Now, let's have a quick excursion into measurement. 
Uh, my colleague Dan Douglas wrote in 2010 uh, a very nice little book, Introduction to Language Testing, which I can only recommend. And there is a chapter on measurement, measurement as a rubber ruler, he called it. So he says the, the meaning of our units of measurement are quite mm, stretchy. We talk about beginners, intermediate, advanced learners, or a B1 learner as opposed to a C1 learner, but that's not a precise exact unit of measurement. And the units are not equidistant. So if I go from beginner to intermediate, how far is that? And if I go from the lower intermediate to the upper intermediate, we don't really know the distances and we don't have an absolute zero. Nobody starts absolutely at zero when we go into another language, especially when it comes to English as a foreign language, because um, there's so many internationalisms around that we all know. So we don't start at zero. And the student with 60 points in one test does not have twice as much skills or proficiency as a student with 30 points. B2 isn't twice as much proficiency as B1. So it's not an exact science. But, and if you retake a test, you may get a different score. We all know that. Oh, I missed the cut score in one, one point, so I'll just retake the test. There's always a margin of error in any measurement. So we know this measurement error. We know the stretch of a test, the rubber ruler. And uh, so we know within which margin of test scores we can reliably think uh, that's the student's true proficiency. And the more measurement points we have, the more accurate results, meaning if we just have one point of measurement, just one task in reading, that may not be enough. But if we have 20, 30, 40 points of measurement, measuring a student's reading competence, we get a fairly accurate result. And we have different means to compare interpretations of these measurement units of these levels. And I'll come to that in a minute. So we have means of comparing, for example, a test's outcome with the CFR proficiency levels. And that helps us to get the measurement as precise as possible, despite the fact that we're not in natural sciences. So let's summarize what the CFR can do for us as um, practitioners in language education, particularly in the realm of assessment, and it, it can, uh, it can inform our learning and teaching goals. It can provide a basis for curriculum development and educational standards. And therefore it can facilitate the constructive alignment between our learning goals, the teaching goals, the outcomes that the educational standards describe and what we want to cover in an assessment. Here, the framework can really be the hub, the linking element. And you can very transparently describe, okay, my students have to reach these goals. These are partly B1, partly B2. Hence, my assessment also has to target that level. And uh, the CFR can be used as a starting point for defining assessment constructs. It can inform learner and teacher-oriented assessment. We already talked about self-assessment. And uh, what I really find important uh, in the CFR is that it... Um, conceptualizes learner language as an authentic language. So the focus lies on what learners already can do and how well they can do it, even at the lowest levels. The kind of learner language the learner uses in order to achieve a communicative goal is seen as an authentic language variety, so to speak, on the way of the learner's journey up to a proficient learner. It, the focus does not lie on a deficit and what a learner cannot do. And I think that has really have had a huge impetus on how we teach languages and how we give feedback. But we have to bear in mind that the CFR is language and context independent. It doesn't describe a certain language, a specific language, and it doesn't describe a specific context. And as you asked with Hindi or Bengali, you will have to interpret and, so to speak, translate these unspecific descriptors into meaningful contextualized language and learner specific descriptors. So if you want to adapt it for Hindi, you may have to make quite a few adaptations. If you want to use it in a school at the secondary level, you may have to adapt it for that context. If you want to use it for um, a curriculum of um, language courses at a uh, university in a languages center, you will have to um, make it more specific for that context. 
And uh, these interpretations make the comparison a bit challenging. If we have different contexts and different languages where we use the CFR, the different meanings of level B1, for example, we have to make them very transparent in order to understand what we mean by a learner is at B1 or this course targets B1. And let's sum up again why the local context matters so much. So we have these generic CFR scales and descriptors. We have a common framework with common language and these common reference levels, the six levels. It's unspecific, no specific language, no specific context. We cannot directly use it in assessment, apart from self-assessment for learners who know themselves. They're not rating scales. So a teacher may want to assess their students, but these uh, descriptors are too unspecific. It's hard to really use them as a rating scale for one precise um, writing task. You will have to adapt them and make them more specific. I'll give you an example in a minute. So it helps to analyze the local context. What are the needs here? What specific language requirements are, what are the learning context variables that you need to take into consideration. So you get one possible interpretation of the CFR. And uh, then you set local cut scores, for example, when you want to decide what level do a learn does a learner have to reach at the end or to be uh, um, admitted to a program, depending on your context. So you have these specific requirements and need, and you will set different cut scores for different institutions. And I've just uh, read in the chat, can different skills at different levels be presented in a single learner? Why or why not? Very good question. Yes, they can. That's a very good comment. We do have learner profiles. You may find learners who are very, very proficient in speaking because they have been in that country and they have spoken for a long time in that second language or foreign language, but they may not really be proficient in writing because that was never uh, their task. They never had to do it. And you find perhaps people who are proficient in reading um, and listening. So the receptive skills, because they live in a border region between two language uh, communities and they can receptively understand their partners, but they cannot speak it productively. So we do find all sorts of profiles and uh, that's why many of the tests and many of the curricula that I know, they specify for the different uh, language skills, different levels of proficiency. And yes, it, that's a one aspect that the CFR allows us to do to come up with learner profiles. All right. We've covered quite a lot of ground, I think. Time for a break. And I'm here quoting my colleague, Piet van Avermaet in a conference in 2014. And he presented this um, analogy there. It's time for a drink, I would say. And if we were all in the lecture hall, then I would ask you, what kind of a drink is that? And uh, this and this. And maybe you wanna put in the chat or maybe tell me, this is supposed to be a mojito. That's what, uh, what Piet van Avermaet used uh, as, a, as an analogy. And his talk was entitled, um, is my mojito your mojito? And that was in 2004. The CFR was out there for three years. And in the language testing community, we were slowly taking, um, getting a grasp on what it can do, what it can't do. And our concern then was, is my B2 your B2? So let's say our universities say we set B2 as the entrance level. And then we were discussing, well, the way we see B2, is that also the way you see B2? And uh, we didn't quite get far with that question. There was a time then when we realized, well, it's not the same. We may all recognize a mojito as a mojito, but they are very different. So the focus shifted towards how, where are the differences and what are they, what, what's characteristic for them? And then, so to speak, this is now my interpretation, we could look at mojito recipes. What are the ingredients and how are they mixed? And you find one recipe, you find perhaps the original recipe or maybe the ultimate recipe. At least now it gets transparent what's in there and how it's done. And then you can compare where they are similar, where they are different. And the question has shifted, at least in the assessment community, towards what is your B2 like? 
show me what's in there. Show me how you interpret the CFR. I like the lemonade thing. That's lovely. Thank you for the comment. Somebody posted uh, lemonade or mojito both are refreshing. So that's true. I could have uh, looked for different lemonade recipes and we'll find millions of them, but we will all recognize a lemonade. So now the question is, what's your lemonade like? How do you make it? What's in there? What's your B2 like? And that's what I meant earlier. If you adapt it for the local context, you can describe what's in there very transparently and then we can discuss okay you see that as b2 well for me it would have to be this way but we can at least discuss what our b2s are like and uh, i'd like now to give you one example for a local rating scale so that we illustrate a little bit how can you localize the cfr and that is work I have done now nearly 10 years ago when I was in Berlin at the Institute for Educational Development. And that was responsible for the educational standards in German school education. And we were evaluating these educational standards and our educational standards for uh, students at the end of uh, secondary schooling were for the different school tracks at A2 respectively B1. And we had to operationalize different constructs and specifications based on these educational standards and relevant CFR scales. So we took the CFR and the standards as a starting point, and the standards were actually also based on the CFR descriptors. They were adapted and localized for our context, and that was our starting point. And we took a level-specific approach. We wanted to cover five CFR levels from A1 because we had students who didn't reach A2 up to C1 because we also have bilingual schools where the students are quite proficient. So we wanted to cover the whole range. Um, and we developed uh, writing tasks and the writing tasks were at each one of these levels. And we said, this is a typical A1 task. A learner at A1 should be able to solve this successfully all the ways up. And we had a rating scale where we also developed descriptors for the CFR levels A1 to C1 based again on these educational standards and the existing CFR scales, existing rating scales in the CFR context. And uh, I'll give you one example for a writing task. So this was our task. Uh, that was actually a real competition from the London Zoo. We took that from the internet. Do you want to be a keeper for a day? really close to our animals? Would you like to find out uh, about the work? Tell us which animal at our zoo you like best. The 10 nicest letters will win a day behind the scenes. And we thought that may be encouraging for the students to write about. They're ninth graders, they're 14, 15 years old. But we thought for a, for a test, this is maybe not specific enough. So we gave a few more instructions. We told them to write a letter and we gave the headkeeper a name and we told the students what they should do, write about a favorite animal, what you, why you like this and what you would like to do so that the students get a bit of structure. And we asked the students to write between 110 and 140 words and we gave them 20 minutes. Now, this is the, the writing task. And the question for you now is, what do you think at which CFR level does a learner have to be at in order to solve this task successfully? And what I'll do now is I'll give you the scales from the CFR that are relevant. You can read through the scales, bear this task in mind. It's a letter to a zookeeper. The students are told what they should write about and they are supposed to write a relatively short letter. And uh, you post in the chat where you think a student has to be in order to solve this task successfully. And here we have uh, the scale from the CFR overall written production. I'll go with you through this. So is it A1 can write simple isolated phrases or sentences? Or do you think a student needs to know how to write a series of simple phrases and sentences linked with simple connectors? Or is it that the student can write straightforward connected texts on a range of familiar subjects within his or her field of interest? Or is it already B2 can write clear detailed texts on a variety of subjects, synthesizing and evaluation information and arguments from a number of sources? Or is it already clear, well-structured text of complex subjects? 
I'll have another scale for you, um, overall written interaction, because it's a letter. The CFR says here at A1, students can ask for or pass on personal details. A2 can write short, simple form you like notes, immediate need. Uh, B1 can convey information, ideas on abstract as well as concrete topics, check information, ask or explain problems, can write personal letters and notes, asking for or conveying simple information of immediate relevance, getting across the point, or does the students have to be at B2, can express news and views efficiently in writing, relate to those of others. I have a third scale and then please post your answers. We have one answer yet. Correspondence, there is a scale in the CFR for correspondence. A1 can write a short, simple postcard. A2 can write very simple personal letters expressing thanks and apology. B1, the lower B1 is can write personal letters describing experiences, feelings and events. And B1 plus the upper level can write personal letters giving news, expressing thoughts about abstract or cultural topics. So, students can post the feedback in the chat box. That would be great. Let me know what you think. At which level should students be or learners be in order to solve this task successfully? We have one who says B2. Do we have other opinions? Any other opinion? No, I can't see any more. Well, our, I'd say C1. Oh, wow. That's quite high. Ours uh, <laughs> to win the contest. That's nice. The teachers who developed these tasks, they were trained teachers from the German school context. They actually put it at B1. And they said, I'll just go back. B1 can write uh, personal letters because it was a personal letter to a zookeeper. It wasn't an, a formal application. Um, describing experiences, feelings, and events. And they said, uh, describe your favorite animal. That's something students are familiar with, why you like this animal, that's your personal preference, what you would like to do, that's kind of a, um, an experience that you would like to have. And uh, our teachers put that at B1. And uh, what we then did, we had these level specific tasks. So this task was estimated, claimed to be at B1, and then we gave this task to students. We had a large piloting study, 5,000 students participated. Some students worked on an A1 or an A2, some had a B1 and a B2 tasks. So we had them all administered to our students. And the answers to this task were assessed with uh, um, descriptors from the CFR level B1. And these were descriptors made very specific for uh, the context. And we had a system where we said the student answer shows exactly what we expect. Then we would give a code two as a pass. Or we had students that were stronger students and we said, well, they show more. So they were given a code three, a pass plus. And we had students who didn't quite reach what we wanted them to do. So they were assessed at below the level and were given a score one. And because we had 5,000 students and students took more than one task, we got a whole range of ratings for the students. And these we could subject to um, 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 statistical analyses. And with these statistical analyses, we then can, uh, we can then find out how proficient the students are and how easy or difficult the task is. But for the assessment themselves, I'd like to show you a bit more from the, uh, the rating scale development. So we used existing descriptors from the CFR and from rating scales that were developed in the CFR context. And we compiled these descriptors into four criteria. We had task fulfillment, organization, grammar, and vocabulary. And uh, we had trials by teachers in the classroom for all the writing tasks. And uh, 
I see one uh, question in the chat box. Is this example specific to writing? Yes, that was a specific writing task. And I only focus on writing today. That was one writing task. And we had a whole range of writing tasks, more demanding ones, more easier ones. And the teachers trialed them in their classroom. So then we got a bit first feedback. And then we used the trials to also try out our rating scales, the teachers, we had 20 teachers in the team, they tried out to assess their students answers with this rating scale, we had several revision cycles to make the scale precise and very specific. And then we had rated training and the final revision as part of the validation. And that was quite a um, uh, two, two, three weeks, um, all in all of work with the raters to get feedback and to check whether they really reliably could use every single descriptor. And then we fine tuned the rating scale so that we got a reliable instrument that raters could actually use uh, in a reliable and valid way. And uh, at the end, as I said, we used um, statistical means in order to estimate, here you see the student's ability. And if you turn your head sideways, you can see a bell curve. So every X stands for, I can't remember quite, I think 500 students. So quite a number of students we have here. And we have here at the top of the scale, very proficient students. And at the bottom of the scale, students at the beginning of their writing career, so to speak. And in the next column, we have the raters. And a rater in the middle means the raters are not too lenient and not too harsh. So our training seemed to have worked quite well. They're all nested nicely in the middle. Nobody is up here or down here. That's very, very good. Here come the criteria. We have organization, vocabulary, grammar, and that's task fulfillment. So they're all nested in the middle, meaning no criteria is too easy or too difficult to reach. And the F stands for task fulfillment. That was a bit easier to reach, but you have seen our tasks. We gave the students quite clear tasks expectations and they shouldn't fail because they hadn't understood the task and the task was aligned to their level of proficiency and hence that is uh, understandable that this criterion is a little bit easier to reach than the others and what we see in the last column is the tasks and c1 b2 b1 a2 and a1 stands for the claims that our task developers had put next to the task. As I showed you the zookeeper task, the teachers who developed it said that should be at a level B1. And that was the claim, the initial claim. And now here we see how difficult or how easy the tasks are. And what we see is that really the task the teacher thought would be the hardest really come up here. And the B1 tasks come here in the middle. And the A2 tasks are easier. Here we have one that was actually misclassified. And that A2 task is maybe too easy for A2. And that was an easy A1 task. So we have these. These are the difficulties that we supposed the tasks would have. And now what we see, the order of difficulty really is according to what we estimated in the beginning. And uh, if you look at the at the areas between the task difficulties, um, what comes next then is that we draw lines here and say, okay, that's the cutoff line between B2 and C1. So these students above the cutoff line, they're placed at C1. Or down here, we need a cutoff line where A2 starts. So students below are placed at A1, students above are placed at A2. And this is called standard setting. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a minute. Because so far, we have only task difficulty estimations. We only estimate how difficult the task is. We claim that the tasks uh, operationalize a certain CFR level, but there's a lot of stretch in the measurement. And now we need experts to judge, okay, where, and here you see the stretch, there's a long gap, where exactly on the scale does B2 start and B1 end? And here we need, human judges again. Statistics alone can't do that for us. So the next big question is how do we align exams to the CFR so that we know at which level the exam is and the students as well. Here comes a methodological question in the chat. Does the task column need to be formal normalized? What does the gap between the two levels reflect? Very, very good question. Yes, it needs to be normalized. 
and that's uh, the so-called standard setting. It's a formalized exercise. I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, the big gap here means that we didn't have any tasks that were easier or more difficult. And that has partly to do with our approach to assessing them. A B1 task was only assessed by the B1 descriptors and a B2 task was only assessed by the B2 descriptors. So there is a bit of an artificiality in our approach. But what you do in a standard setting exercise is you can look at the tasks and give them to a panel of experts and let the panels decide, like I did with you earlier, what, what does a learner have to do in order to solve this task successfully? But you can also look at the student answers and give the student answers across the whole range of the scale to an expert channel, um, panel, and they then judge the student answers. And then you can actually um, get closer to the um, cutoff score between B1 and B2 and fill these gaps. These are an artifact by our way of uh, assessing students, but you see here on the student side that we don't have these gaps. So you can use the student answers in order to fill these gaps. So um, I won't have time to go into too much details and standard setting does get quite formal. There is a video of a presentation I have given on exactly this uh, work on standard setting in this context. And uh, what I can do is I post the YouTube link into the chat here. So if you want to go a bit more into the methodology, then you can watch this video at your, in your own time. That's available there. And we've also written a whole book on how we set the standards, the educational standards in, in uh in Germany, how we align them to the CFR. And just uh, a little bit of details here. There is a whole manual for relating language examinations to the CFR, also by the Council of Europe. Um, I'll paste that link in the chat box as well. And that gets quite technical. So I assume you may not want to go into too technical details here. And the manual outlines a range of possible steps and procedures to align your exam to the CFR. And it encourages increased transparency on the part of the examination providers. And that goes back to our mojito or lemonade recipes. You describe exactly what's in your test and how you align it to the CFR from a content analysis point of view, how you collect data because you need empirical data and how you then analyze statistically the data and how you use this resulting scale and uh, work with uh, human judgments, human experts who again judge the students' answers and the task difficulty in order to align them to the CFR. And there you get different um, views so from different angles, you can verify your results and come to a, a reliable um, decision on where you draw the line between one CFR level and the next. And there's also practical tools and technical supplements in the manual to assist you technically with the, with the methodological choices you have. And just as a quick overview, we won't get into too much detail here. The manual outlines different stages of the linking process. And here is the specification stage. And this is where the test provider really describes and analyzes the test content and can describe that against the CFR. And there's also, um, there's also tools available that help you specify your tests so that you can describe like in a recipe very transparently how you operationalized the CFR levels, what your B2 is like and what, what you have in your test specifications. Then comes the formal stage of standard setting where you need um, empirical data. You need to collect these data. Then you need to train your uh, judges and they have to either judge the difficulty of the test items, the tasks, or they have to benchmark performance samples to the CFR level, meaning anything in the, in the realm of writing or speaking. These performances then you are judged against the CFR. And then you come to the validation phase where you have the different angles. You have the specifications in the beginning where you have an estimation where the test should be. You have the formal standard setting with empirical data. 
and there you get the the scales where you see where the students are and where the tasks are in terms of the difficulty and then you get the judges estimation where you should draw the cut scores and this you all document in a transparent way and then somebody who wants to use your test can see how you designed it what data you collected how you aligned it and how you are reporting your test results with regard to the cfr levels so let's look again just to sum up because it's a very complex um, endeavor so i'll try to make this a bit more um, transparent so you have different test items be it reading tests or be it writing tasks and you have students that have to take the test you need data and uh, then if it's um, productive skills you need a rating scale for the student performances and these data then are subjugated to IRT scaling and IRT means item response theory. And that's what I've just shown you in this in this map where you had the column for the students and the column for the raters and the criteria and the tasks. IRT is a probabilistic um, means from the statistics uh, tools where you can estimate student ability and task difficulty at the same time. And that's based on how many items a student successfully solved. So the item difficulty is a function of student ability. But don't worry, I'll not go into um, statistical means here. But that's a very well established um, means in the field of language testing where you can calibrate your test items and you estimate the difficulty and the student ability at the same time on the same scale. And then comes the CFR levels where we then say, OK, how do we get the test difficulties and the student abilities on different CFR levels? And this is the formal standard setting methods where human judges draw these lines based on um, different procedures and based on empirical data. And this is a human judgment. And here we come again with a rubber rule and a stretch. Human judgments all contain errors of measurement. so we have to admit that setting these green lines is an arbitrary decision. There is nowhere in the world a way to say it has to be exactly here. It's your local context and it's the experts you have in your panel and it's the methods you use. Different experts, different contexts, different methods will yield different results. We have to live with that. So there is a stretch here in setting cut scores. We have just to bear that in mind. Now, let's go a little bit on a detour in order to um, explain what it means to be at a level. I'll use an example of my hobby. When I'm not at my desk and working with language tests or giving lectures, I love to hang out in, in the rocks and uh, I love climbing. And you wouldn't believe how much similarities there are between climbing and language learning. I was surprised when I got into this a little bit more. First of all, in Germany in 1926, we had six levels of proficiency in climbing and the CFR has six levels of proficiency. So that was a correspondence I found quite interesting. Nowadays we go up to 12 levels of difficulty, but the first six Sufis. And when we look at the difficulty characteristics, um, um, I'll come to that question in the chat in a minute. And when we look at what constitutes a difficulty of a level, be it in language learning or climbing, in climbing, we look how steep is the route, what are the handholds like, what skills and techniques do I need? And uh, similarly, in a language task, we have similar criteria where we can determine the difficulty of a task. And the question at which level am I? That's a question that's not only interested for language learners, but also for us climbers. Now, if I tell you there is an interaction between the root features and my abilities, that is exactly what's also in language learning. This is an interaction of the task difficulty and the learner's abilities. It's the same. And uh, the big question for me is, how many roots of a given level do I have to master that you believe me that I'm a climber at a certain level? Now I can tell you, I'm a climber at the top end of level six. Sometimes I manage uh, uh, routes from level seven, but the question for you now, and please type again your answers in the YouTube channel or here in the chat, how many 
roots do I have to master that you believe me? Let's let's say I go to the gym with you, to the climbing gym. There are 10 routes of level six. And uh, I say, I'm, I'm at the top of level six. How many routes of that level do you want me to climb and master that you believe me? All 10? Only five? Only one? How? What's the percentage that you would want me to master that you believe me that I'm at level six? And that's the big question. We'll come back to why it's a big question for language testing. Whoever has an idea or an estimation, how many do you want to see? I give you a few minutes to think about that. And I read out the question from the chat box. Could we delegate the experts task to an AI engine like GPT-3 to make it more objective? At the moment, I have to say, I don't think uh, an engine could do that. We can, we can uh, get indices of text difficulty. For example, a reading text, we have reading indices. We can use that and that's used, but there is such an interplay between the different facets of task demands and the local context that I haven't seen an AI, AI engine yet that will master that interplay. Because you also have to estimate um, um, the, the, the interplay between the local context, your students, the experts should know the students very well, and the interplay between the schooling situation, for example, and uh, the interplay between all the different task features. So I fear, yes, we will need, and luckily we will need human experts for some more time with all the drawbacks. But at the moment, I don't see uh, an AI engine at the horizon that really could do all these complex uh, estimations. Now, I haven't heard from anybody here, how many routes do you want me to climb in percentage? 50% enough? That you say, yeah, well, she has managed 50%, but the other 50, she can't manage. She's still at level six. This is an important question, which will come in a minute again in terms of uh, language examinations. Oh, that's nice. One route only that will be at the difficulty level. So I fail in nine and I manage one. And you would say, yes, you're at level six. That's nice. I've seen a whole spread of answers. I've also seen people who say 90%, others say 50%, 60%. So it's like with a language test when you say, okay, how many tasks does a student have to master so that you believe the student is at that level? We'll come back to that question in a minute. Um, let's have a quick look at uh, the language related example. This is the scale from the CFR for speaking. And we are now looking at a language learner between A2 and B1. And this example is taken from my colleague, John de Jong, also at the conference 2004. So we, we're looking at a person who is right between A2 and B1, hypothetically speaking. And uh, the thing with the probabilities is that a person right at this border will probably be able to do 80% of A2 tasks, but can also already do about 50% of the B1 tasks. Because it's the same with climbing. I manage nearly all sixes, but sometimes there's a route with features I'm not good at and I just can't climb it. But I can also sometimes climb a route, an easier route from the seven, from a level seven upwards. So there's a a probability, the easier the route, the more likely it is I can climb it, the more difficult the route, the less likely it is, but I'm good at some moves and not good at other moves. So if a route is really um, suiting my abilities, then I can climb a route at a level seven. So there is not a clear cut point in reality, as you all know, our students don't jump from one proficiency level to the next. And this is nicely modeled by this IRT scaling. There is an increasing probability. Students at lower levels have lower probability of getting a difficult task right. And students at higher proficiency levels have a high probability of getting the easy tasks right. That's the assumption between that uh, model. And that models reality quite nicely. 
So bear that in mind. A, a learner here, that doesn't mean they can't do any B1 tasks. And yes, it's like learning to play the violin. There's a chat comment. If I can manage to play Four Seasons or Beethoven Symphony without any difficulty, I'd be known as a maestro. Yes. And there may be some superheroes in the violin field that can play anything off the leaf. But others, you will see it's similar with any kind of skills that you develop. You may master certain things with a less likelihood than others that are more easy. And uh, this is the underlying IRT scale. So somebody here, the probability of doing difficult tasks decreases, but it's never totally impossible. And the probability of solving easier tasks increases, but they may still fail. So that's the assumption between these uh, IRT scales, between the way we model item difficulty and student ability. So what does it then mean to be at a level? For example, B1, let's stay with this learner who is right between A2 and B1. And uh, now comes my question to you in a minute, because some test providers require that test takers are able to solve 50% of the items of a level to be classified as being at that level. Or some of you said, I only need to climb one six, then you believe me, I'm at that level. And then there are other people, often researchers that state that you have to be able to solve the majority of items of a level to be classified as being at that level. Now, my big question, at which CFR level would the test provider A place this student? And at which CFR level would the researcher B place this student? Please type your answers in the chat box or in the YouTube channel. Because this student is able to solve 50% at B1 and 80%, the vast majority of A2. How would that student be classified? Is it a safe A2 learner? Is it a beginning B1 learner? Where would the test providers classify the student? What test result would that student get with that test provider who says, you saw 50% of that level and I classify you at being at that level? Do we have any answers. So what would, what level would the test provider say? Is this student at B1 or A2? This is the moment where I would love to be with you guys in the room. Then we could have a nice chat and discussion. Yes, exactly. The test provider would say this student is at B1. 50% is enough. You're at B1. But if you say, no, that's not enough, I, wanna, I want you to master that level, then this student would be classified at A2. And, oops, here we go. So the test provider would say B1, and the researcher who says I have harder criteria would say the student is at A2. And that's another problem. Uh, there are different interpretations of what it means to be at a level. So that was the big question with my climbing, um, because it's, it's really hard to, there is no verdict, there, there is no, um, it's quite subjective. And there's a comment in the chat, yes, exactly. It is subjective and it depends on where you set the cut score here. Do you say 50%, do you say 65%? And both is out there and you have to read in the test providers manuals where they set the cut score in order to understand is this student really at the beginning of B1, halfway through at the top end of B1. And if the test providers don't specify it and don't tell you, then you can't know. And there is subjectivity in it. There are different um, um, rationales for doing it. But you have to be aware that if the student takes one test where the 50% margin is used, then that student will get a B1 result. If the student takes another test where they used 65 or 70% as a margin, then the student will come out at A2. And you see how subjective, so to speak, um, the alignment to the CFR is. And it's not to speak subjective, so to speak, but it's just different 
different approaches and different cut scores that people use because there's nobody out there who could say this is the right way or this is the wrong way. Hence, you have to transparently document what you do and then test user can look at it and say, well, 50%, no, that's not enough for me. I want, I want a test that actually uses 65 or 70% because I want to be sure the students can master more than just 50% at this level. So it's a matter of making it transparent. And here comes the stretch again. And we find discrepancies. And then that results in the non-comparability of test results. And that's when people say, well, all these tests are not, no good for nothing. I took that test and I get a B1 and I take that test and I get an A2. And the CFR levels are quite coarse. And I'll come in a minute to a suggestion where we could maybe make it more fine-grained with a look to the clock. Um, how long do I still have, Shantanu? When should I stop? Have you have you have some maybe 10, 10 or 15 minutes maybe. Okay, then I would minutes. say I'll skip a few things and go but a little you, bit. But it's up to you. But it's up to you. If you want to continue more than that, it's okay. So we have a hard limit uh, uh, for about 15, uh, 20 minutes. Because, okay. Uh, uh, 20 minutes is something that we can okay. very safely, safely. Excellent. I'll rush through a few slides and uh, maybe we leave a little bit of time for discussion at the end for questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess I got the point across that there's also stretch in uh, the comparability of test results and it's nothing, nobody is wrong or, or doing it the wrong way. It's just different ways of doing it. And it's very, very important to look at how the tests have aligned their tests to the CFR in order to understand the results. And, uh, how can we compare different tests? You have all seen these test comparison tables. That's from my languages center where I work. And we have different tests, IELTS, Cambridge exams, TOEFL, Trinity College, and so on. There's Pearson, there's ETS, many more tests here. And we use, um, I'll skip that. Um, we use the CFR actually. We do use it as a means of comparing different tests. This is by no means perfect, but it's as close as we can. We look into the alignment of these tests to the CFR, and then we use their alignment in order to come up with such a comparison table. And that's for university entrance purposes. And I guess we're doing this similarly all across the world. And we would need to take into consideration our purpose of the examination. Is it for uni entrance or exit? Is it for licensing purposes? We look at a target group. We look at the construct of the tests. Are these tests really made for our target group and our construct? What content do the tests measure? If it's an academic entrance test, I want a test with academic tasks and academic content and challenging tasks. What assessment criteria are there? Are they relevant for my context? And for defining construct content and criteria, we can use the CFR, it can inform it, can't give us the answers. We have different test formats. That's interesting to look at it. Is it only closed formats, multiple choice, or do we actually ask the student to produce some longer stretches of writing, which I would find important in a uh, university entrance test. And all this should be specified by the test providers. They need to show you, this is what I do. Think of the mojito recipe. Then we need test scores. We need to collect real empirical data and they need to be IRT scaled. You need data here. Then you can look at the different reporting levels, proficiency levels. And here we have the standard setting and the validation so that in the end, we can really report the student proficiency in terms of CFR levels if we wish to do so. So that will be rounding off the comparison procedures of different tests. Now, um, we'll skip through a few of these slides. Um, uh, scores and levels, usually they are reported at different scales. Here we have the Cambridge English scale from 80 to 230. All their grades A, B, C are aligned to this scale and this scale is aligned to the CFR. So if you get a grade A in the Cambridge proficiency exam, you know you have above 220 um, points and you're at the top level of C2, same holds here for the IELTS. That's one way of transparently reporting everything. We have a, a score guide, for example, with the PTE academic that looks like this. You have the different skills and they show you where you are with the overall score. And that refers back to the question we had earlier. Here you see nicely a student's um, profile. Very strong in 
writing and speaking, not so strong in listening uh, and, and you see, and very strong in grammar, not so strong in oral fluency. So you get a profile here and the score scale has also been aligned to the CFR. So you can see where you are at the CFR and TOEFL has different scores and reports for the different skills, your scores with high intermediate and low levels. And in a different document, you find the alignment of the TOEFL scores to the CFR. So all the big uh, tests have their own scores and their own bands and their own alignment to the CFR. And uh, one thing I find important before I come to an end, the more details the report contain, scores, alignment to a common or global scale and the CFR levels descriptors, the better informed you are as a test user and you know what your students can do if they reach a certain score. And the fine-grained score reports allow a much clearer picture of where on the proficiency level the student is most likely located. But bear in mind the measurement error we talked about earlier. So we have a little bit of stretch here. But the course of the score reports, the less information you get, have a look at this. We have a student at the beginning of B1. If I only report B1, I don't know whether the student is at the beginning or the top end of B1. And B1 has a stretch. Same with score bands. IELTS 6 has a stretch. And uh, what you will find is that a student who is at the beginning of B2 may be much closer to a student at the upper end of B1 than the student at the upper end of B1 is close to the student at the beginning of B1. So you get my point. If you have only course score bands, you don't know where exactly the student is. The more fine grained, the better the information for you as a test user. So bear that in mind when you have to choose different tests. How do we deal with misclassifications? Just to sum up, the reasons could lie in differences in the coarseness of the scores and in the measurement errors. The reasons could lie in different alignment methods. As we have said, there is a differences in where you set the cut score and which methods you use, a different interpretation of what it means to be at a level. Do I have to solve 50%, 80%, less more? So that leads to misalignment, misclassifications. We have tests with different constructs, formats, and criteria. And uh, um, cut scores on a proficiency, it's, it's quite an arbitrary decision to set them there. And uh, recently, the Council of Europe has uh, published this um, graph, which I find much more um, precise for um, learning a language, because you learn not only more in terms of more steps, you don't jump from one level to the next, but you learn more also, you broaden your vocabulary, not only um, quantitatively, but you use it more precisely qualitatively. So these growing cycles make for me much more sense. But so far, Mm, we don't have psychometric statistical models that can actually take that into account. So there's still work to be done. But I like these concentric circles as modeling proficiency much better than the, the stair, the, 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 the uh, steps or the, the linear um, uh, proficiency levels going in one line, linear directions. So we do need a little bit more research on comparing international tests, but I won't bore you with that. Um, it's hard to compare them qualitatively and quantitatively because we don't find students who take 10 different English tests so that we could really reliably compare them. But there is some research in the pipeline with some colleagues I know. And uh, I'd like to come now to the end. Many thanks for your attention. And I hope we still have some time for questions and discussions. And I'll go maybe back to that slide because I quite like this as a springboard for discussions. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I look forward to some comments in the chat box. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Harsh, for a very, very excellent and uh, illuminating lecture. And uh, uh, I personally have gained a lot from this, and I'm sure that the students uh, will give me feedback later. Some of them are really shy, so they don't want to, you know, give out their, <laughs> divulge their secrets. Uh, one question that I have received from uh, the YouTube, again, from the YouTube section, uh, there are several, but this, this is a kind of repeated questions that is coming, uh, is that why do we need testing at all? 
if if I know that I am at this level, why does somebody else need to know, uh, or or just like like a kind of you know certification? So I can ask me to self certify that I am at this level because I know the criteria. I could follow. I can submit an affidavit rather than a test. Oh, valid question. Important question. I guess it has to do with the way our world um, is working exactly. at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. If you want a job, your employer wants to have certificates. If you tell your employer, I'm really good at this and I'm really good at that, um, the employer may say, yeah, that's nice, but I want proof. And I guess it has to do more with that fact. Also, when you think of you want to go abroad, studying in a certain language, like we have international students coming to Germany, and they have to have a certain level of German uh, in order to function here at the university. And uh, we're not doing them a favor if we just open the door and say, come in, because we, we've, we've uh, seen that. I have had a, a longitudinal study with uh, students who struggled immensely when they, they came with a C1 German. And then they said, oh, after looking back over the whole year, they said, oh, then the fun only began. We thought we have reached C1. Now we can work and function, but the, it only starts then when you go into the academic use of German or English. And uh, if the students certify themselves, they may not, they may not know what, what they're expected to do later. So if we have a good entrance test, which actually asks them for academic cognitive challenging tasks, like read different sources, summarize them, come up with your own um, stance and write a coherent longer piece of text then that is very indicative of what students can do when they come at universities. So Absolutely. these formal tests, they help students to understand, uh, am I prepared for what comes? Because otherwise the students may fail for language reasons and that would not be fair. So sometimes the high stakes tests do have their reason if they have valid tests that reflect the future language tasks then there is a good reason for taking that test because it shows you whether you're really prepared for this kind of task in a more objective way than you could perhaps do in self-assessment. And uh, it has to do with uh, a lot of um, gatekeeping functions of institutions who on the one hand want students to empower, to be empowered, to be in a position of really doing their work that, I, that they are expected to do. And on the other hand, it has to do with the way our societies use accountability for the moment. We won't get a, around that at the moment. I don't see another society at the moment where you would really not have to account with proof for what you can do, Absolutely. whether we like it so, or not. So uh, this is uh, uh, a question from me. Uh, from the research side. So uh, are you aware, I I'm sure that there are, so can you point a direction to some research that uh, tries to correlate uh, the criteria and reference to self-assessment uh, that the students, so like the ones that you showed, okay, so I have normed of A1, A2 or B1, B2, so I want to rate myself. With that, uh, you know, how, how the experts have rated the same participants. Mm -hmm. There is research around, and I remember one of my PhD students, Ebtisam from Saudi Arabia, and when I was at University of Oregon, England, I supervised her there, and she actually looked how the CFR could be implemented in the pre-university courses for Saudi Arabian students who go to the university there, and everything is in the medical schools, everything is in English, so they teach in English, and the students have to reach quite a high level, and what she did in this context, the students and the teachers were not familiar yet with the CFR, and she gave them this self-assessment grid in an online um, environment, and the students assessed themselves, and the students' teachers assessed the students. And uh, there was quite a lot of correlation between the two, and, uh, and uh, we didn't have the means to also administer an already calibrated test. That would have been really nice to look, okay, in how far are the students um, self-assessment aligning with their official test results. We didn't have that chance, but I would have to look into the literature whether that has been done. I have nothing on the top of my head, but the results there were quite reassuring. And it was, again, the higher level students were underestimating. The teachers estimated the higher level students a bit higher than the 
students themselves and the lower level students estimated themselves a little bit higher than the teachers did. So there is research in looking into self-assessment and uh, teacher assessment. And I have nothing on the top of my head where self-assessment has been compared with um, hard uh, facts. Yeah, so from that, that's an interesting research. point uh, that you draw. And it's quite natural that when uh, uh, somebody who, who knows about the criteria, uh, who is trying to assess himself or herself, would try to put them more or less, uh, you know, objectively. Uh, that's the assumption. Then, but then we also have to assume that the expert who is uh, who is uh, judging the uh, according to the set criteria is also not, you know, subject to a certain bias that you refer to. You know, so the top performers getting higher scores than actually they did in a set standardized test, or the reverse thing happening for low performers. So. Yeah. Uh, the question really is, uh, as I, if I can put it right this, like this, that how can we arrive at a, some kind of a, you know, a structure or, or, or a mechanism whereby we have a more equitable way of assessing people? So that, that's a you know, re uh, recurring stance that people, assessors, especially language assessors, face every day. So why do we want to give somebody a higher, higher rating? than a lower one. So for one thing is that, you know, uh, this, this can be advantageous to the person, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, the, the subjectivity and objectivity needs to be balanced. Yeah, so I, I would I uh, agree. like to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So this, the more... uh, this thing, yeah, so this thing, yeah, yeah, please continue. No, I just wanted to say the more windows you have on the student's proficiency and ability and performances, the more accurate your estimation of what the students can do and at which level they are will be. So to speak, self-assessment, teacher's assessment, formative assessment over time, and then accompanied by um, the standardized tests, then you may get a really round picture of what the students can do. Yeah, so uh, that's a really, really, uh, you know, uh, great discussion and presentation i really must thank you and like all good things must come to an end for some time so we will uh, we would like to formally thank you for your excellent presentation and sharing of your thoughts and uh, also on behalf of the carl university and the department of english studies i would like to express my heartfelt thanks to you for you know sparing some time from your so busy schedule and uh, accommodate us within the framework of our Thursday seminars. So thank you once again, thank you, Sean. Uh, You're very welcome, and, uh, it was a pleasure. And uh, we would uh, like to continue this interaction further. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for so, having me and all the best, oh, it was take a care. Pleasure. And we'll stay in touch. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, all the best. Bye bye. So there you go. So uh, I will be in touch with you uh, after a f uh, after a few uh, hours. So please, uh, you know, uh, I, I I apologize not being able to be in touch in the last uh, one and a half months. So <laughs> I was actually uh, busy with some other things, and then I was not well. So. I apologize, oh, but no but, worries. Uh, I think uh, it worked out. Uh, thank it you all so worked much. out. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, the situation must be really harsh in India. Yeah, from what uh, we hear here. The main thing is the COVID situation is not improving much beyond yeah. a certain level. Uh, although everybody is trying their hardest, but human mind for the past one and a half years, two years, you know, they're bored by sitting at home. So they yeah. go out, take risks, and situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same here. Same everywhere. <laughs> it's, human, yeah, human but human I human. guess you have still difficulties getting enough vaccine. Uh, that's not that's not the uh, problem anymore. Okay. Because, Super. Uh, our government is. Uh,